As you all know, this week has been a busy week. First, we had the note holders in the Bed Bath & Beyond bankruptcy have their little spat with Bed Bath & Beyond. Then, we had the hearing for the MMTLP Blue Sheets case against FINRA. And then, AMC got all tangled up in the Antara deal, and now there's a lawsuit against Antara, also in New York. And then we finally got the ruling on the MMTLP case, and of course, it came down exactly like I told everyone it was going to go down. But lost in all the shuffle of this is one of the cases that I've been following for a while now, and that's the NCMI bankruptcy, and that is what this video is about. Now, I have still not gotten the recordings of the hearing. I'm going to file a petition with the court Tuesday when they're open after this extended holiday, and hopefully I'll be able to get those recordings to you, same as I have done for all the other NCMI hearings. But if not, this will just have to suffice, looking at the docket and drawing our own inferences from what happened. Now, for those of you that are just now tuning in on the NCMI bankruptcy case, I have a playlist for it on my channel, but to pick us up from where we are last time, NCMI had just come to terms with Cineworld as to their agreements between each other because Cineworld's in bankruptcy, and now they are coming before their own bankruptcy judge to get these approved by the other parties. These agreements were part of the settlement deal in Cineworld's bankruptcy, but they still have to be approved by the other bankruptcy hearing dealing with NCMI. So a hearing was set for the 15th on that, and at the same time, NCMI also releases its first amended plan and supplement for its plan to get out of Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Both of those things were being covered this week, and uh, they, uh, they didn't go so well for them. Now, on both of these motions, AMC and Cinemark rejected them and filed papers with the court to do such. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they are outright against it. They may have specific points of it that they are against, and we'll get to that in a second. But what I think is the most vehement dissent comes from Harkins Theaters. Now, if you remember from earlier in the week, uh, for those that do follow me on the uh, subreddit r slash NCMI, you will remember that I brought up that I had a contact that was also following this case that had listened to the actual conference call hearing and noted that there was a bit of a verbal jostling and scuffle that got so bad and so heated that the judge almost sent someone to 24-hour chill pill zone in a county prison. And this document, this document right here, I'm pretty sure is the one that caused that. Let's go over it. If you want to follow along, I have a link in the description to my NCMI folder on my Google Drive, which has all of the different document items from the docket that I have downloaded and put in there so that you guys can keep up at your leisure with what's going on in this case. The one that we'll be looking at right now is docket item or DI-337. And there's a bit of background that the lawyers for Harkins goes into, but the real meat of it starts on page four where it says that Regal eyes the Harkins contract. And at paragraph 10, Regal, through its special relationship with the debtor, had knowledge of the Harkins contract. Regal regarded the Harkins contract as more favorable compared to Regal's deal under the Regal ESA. Indeed, on at least two separate occasions, the debtor advised Harkins that Regal CEO had complained about the comparative favorability of the Harkins contract. Specifically, in September of 2022, the debtor's CEO told Harkins CFO that Regal was not satisfied with the Regal ESA. Regal was aware of the terms of the Harkins contract and was demanding similar deal terms. On paragraph 11, they go on to say that Regal CEO was putting more pressure on the debtor to change the terms of their deal. However, once bankruptcy began, on April 26 for NCMI, they reassured Harkins that they would not be rejecting the Harkins contract. But on June 5th, without any prior signaling or discussion, the debtor informed Harkins that the debtor would reject the Harkins contract. 
the timing of the debtor's about face coincides with the debtor's announcement that the debtor had struck a new deal with Regal. And that's the one that we had known previously about from the last time I was talking with you folks. They then go in to finish up the background on page six, paragraph 14, by basically accusing Cineworld of anti-competitive practices. Harkins believes that the discovery concerning the debtor's business decisions to reject the Harkins contract, particularly in light of the timing to reject and Regal's expressed jealousy about the Harkins contract, will evidence that Regal used its outsized leverage over the debtor's business plan and plan process to unlawfully monopolize and conspire to implement an unlawful group boycott of Harkins in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act and state antitrust laws. Yikes. On page 7 starts their objections, and under Roman numeral 1, they give the reasons for why it does not satisfy the bankruptcy code, with the first being the plan is not confirmable because there's a substantial risk of suit under the antitrust law, and thus the invalidation of the settlement. They argue that the affiliate agreement may constitute an unlawful group boycott, that it also may constitute an unlawful conspiracy to monopolize an industry. They also accuse, beyond the Sherman antitrust laws, tortious interference on page 13, and then remark that the plan is not feasible for several reasons. Not only because of the administrative claims under antitrust law, which they remark would cause damages not just from the claims themselves, but from intensive discovery, litigation, and the fact that Harkins may be entitled to treble damages, which means that any damages that arise out of an antitrust lawsuit are then times by three and then billed to the defendant. So yes, that is what caused the bombshell on Thursday that caused all the fireworks. At the end though, clearly whatever happened was not resolved in Harkin's favor as they later withdrew the motion. Now the reason why I saved AMC and Cinemark's rejections for the last is because they're easier to handle with and they're both pretty much the same. Now if you recall from previously, NCMI is an UPSI structure, an umbrella partnership corporation and the members of it are Cineworld, Cinemark, AMC and then the fourth leg is the public facing public company that's actually on the exchange. Because of this all three of these companies have the same founder agreements with NCMI and under those founding documents they have to be treated equally. That means if the terms for Cineworld change then the terms for AMC and Cinemark have to be changed and they have to be compensated equally under those terms. Because of this, both AMC and Cinemark are objecting to the emergency motion to approve the settlement and are also objecting to the bankruptcy terms under the same grounds because if the settlement's approved, it would amend the bankruptcy proceedings and compromise the bankruptcy plan as well. That's kind of the in short encapsulation. Like I said, both of these documents for both companies, Cinemark and AMC, will be in my NCMI folder. So if you want to look over them in more detail, you can. I find it funny that heading into this moment, the big concern that I had and a lot of people have pointed out is the nuisance that the unsecured creditors would cause in this bankruptcy proceeding. But it seems that the thing that most of us thought was going to be the most sure deal, getting the Cineworld issue out of the way, is now going to become a future roadblock because the other two members of the contract are like, hey, you changed the deal terms. We want a slice of that pie too. And so now there's going to be even more jockeying to get that situation remedied. So all three of them are on the same page. And in the meantime, we still have the unsecured creditors floating around there. And at any point, they could cause this soup mess of a problem to be even worse. So um, I'm not saying that I'm dogging completely on this situation. But this is the exact kind of mess that I was warning about that would happen in this bankruptcy situation. And it seems like it's becoming even more of a caldering stew.
personally, I hope it gets settled out, but there's a good chance that things might get altered in the bankruptcy uh, terms and the bankruptcy plan for NCMI going forward, and we'll just have to keep an eye on that going forward. But uh, that is that is all that happened last week. A lot going on there that happened in NCMI's bankruptcy hearing, and I will try and get a hold of those, uh, those hearings that took place, the audio transcripts, so we can have a listen to those and know with more clarity what the issues are, what's going down, and what needs to be concerned over. If you are stuck in this position heading into the bankruptcy, what what it are, are could it be that it gets changed and the equity gets liquidated? I highly doubt that because we're still dealing with member groups that have those equity stakes, but there might be certain terms that ruin or damage uh, NCMI's profitability that might make future forecasting have to change. Who knows? Um, I'll try and get more information on that and I will catch up with you folks next time. But this is where we'll end for now. I'll see you folks later.